Reporting from Portsmouth, the nuclear submarine Sea Dragon heads northward for a tour of duty at Pearl Harbor. The conventional passage lies to the south through Panama or around the tip of South America. But Sea Dragon sails northward to the cooler waters of the Canadian archipelago. Her job? To blaze a new and more direct northwest passage. A dream of mariners for centuries. Motion picture film records the image sent back by underwater television cameras as the Sea Dragon dives deep under giant icebergs. Throughout the historic passage, a crew of scientists collects information about the ocean's water, its bottom, and its ice. For this route could someday be most important to national security. This ice pack someday a perfect hiding place for a missile launching submarine. Sea Dragon successfully completes the passage and makes a side trip to the North Pole. Navy scuba divers take an icy plunge of exploration. Their camera footage reveals vegetation and plankton beneath the polar ice. Water temperature, 29 teeth chattering degrees. Leave it to the Navy to stage the world's most unique ball game. The playing field is the North Pole. The players' uniforms, bulky cold weather gear. And the audience stands in preference to sitting on the polar ice. A home run travels from today into tomorrow, from one side of the world to the other. Runners travel around the world as they tag the bases. But the umpire is still a you-know-what. From a bearded gentleman, congratulations to Sea Dragon. The Northwest Passage is open, a dream of seafaring men fulfilled. Chief steward aboard the submarine USS Catfish departs for Washington to compete in a national baking contest. The prize, $25,000. His competitors, 99 top flight women cooks. He's Ramon G. Caballona, busy here stirring up an orange pecan cream pie, a delicacy that nets him first prize in the dessert division and $1,000. But the big winners are the ones who enjoy the recipe all the time. The crew of the catfish. And what does Chief Steward Caballona call his concoction? Well, being a submariner, it just has to be submarine delight. Twin honors for Rear Admiral William F. Rayburn for his work as project officer in charge of the Polaris program, he's congratulated by Secretary of the Navy, William B. Frankie. And along with the congratulations, an award, the Distinguished Service Medal. The second recognition of a job well done, the three-star shoulder boards of a vice admiral. Destroyers, battleship, aircraft carrier, Polaris. A great day in the varied career of Vice Admiral William F. Rayburn. The Enterprise, powered by eight nuclear reactors, the largest and mightiest naval vessel in history, and this is her launching. A crowd of 15,000 gathers at Newport News, Virginia, for the christening of the 1,100-foot-long aircraft carrier. Chief of Naval Operations Admiral Arleigh Burke describes the Enterprise as the largest ship ever built of any kind by any nation. As the letters in her name light up to indicate the water level in the dock, the 85,000-ton ship is floated off her building blocks. She's too big for sliding down the waves. She's christened Enterprise, the eighth naval vessel to bear the name. The name is old, but the concept is totally new, for Enterprise is the only nuclear-powered aircraft carrier in the world. Ship number 601 is the Robert E. Lee, the first nuclear-powered submarine to be built in the South. In ceremonies at Newport News, she joins the fleet, the third of the fleet ballistic missile submarines to be commissioned. With Union Jack, Ensign, and commissioning pennants hoisted, she nears operational status, a mobile, long-range concealed launching site for 16 Polaris missiles. 
Navy's second nuclear submarine, Seawolf, first commissioned in 1957, is recommissioned at Groton, Connecticut. Her sodium-cooled reactor was an experimental guinea pig in the crash development of nuclear propulsion. Recommissioning marks its replacement by a pressurized water reactor. At ceremonies driven indoors by the weather, Commanding Officer Alfred J. Whittle reads his ship's orders and poses with previous skippers of this and the World War II Seawolf. An R-7B wings the loft as the Navy prepares for a needle in the haystack search operation. The elusive needle sought by these instruments is the Discoverer 8 space capsule to be returned from space after 17 polar orbits. An attempted catch in mid-air by the Air Force proved unsuccessful, but the instrumented nose cone beeped a come-and-get-me signal. Ship, helicopter, and frogman form a Navy team that gets to the nose cone within three hours of its ejection from the satellite. It's all a rehearsal for the program to put a man into space. Getting him back to Earth is a critical part of the operation. Perhaps this is the way the first astronaut will someday return from man's most exciting adventure. At the Lock Haven, Pennsylvania plant of the Piper Aircraft Corporation, a new Navy plane is born. She's the U-01, the Aztec. She's small and rugged, and she'll never set a speed mark or a shoot down an enemy plane, but she wears her star proudly and takes to the air like a veteran. Metal construction, swept back tail, and graceful lines, Aztec is almost too good looking to be called a utility plane. But the 500 horses and her twin engines will be put to good use by Navy flyers, carrying on the routine Navy business that makes the more glamorous deeds possible. So it's welcome aboard, Aztec. An aviation speed record in the making as a Phantom II leaves the runway at Edwards Air Force Base and heads for the rarefied atmosphere of 45,000 feet. It's a 100-kilometer closed-circuit course, a circular path 62 miles in length, high above California's Mojave Desert. It takes radar to hold the F-4H-1 on such an exacting course as it streaks to a new world's record. 1,390 miles an hour. Time to complete the 62-mile circle, just less than 41 seconds. Handling the controls for the record-shattering flight, Commander John F. Davis. At a press conference in Washington, he demonstrates his plan of action from takeoff to letdown. An acceleration run down the slot to the beginning of the 100-kilometer course, a near vertical bank as he covers the 62 miles, then home for payday. In this case, a distinguished flying cross, something for a family to be proud of. The record tops the Russian claim by 100 miles an hour. The LSD Epping Forest delivers the goods, more than 50 tons of it, from the people of America to the people of Korea. Food, clothing, medical supplies, weapons in a war against hunger, poverty, and disease. Operation Handclasp, it's called, a part of the People to People program. In the setting of a Korean children's hospital, the slogans become meaningful. out, sailor, you'll get trampled in the rush. But what can you expect from the boys of this orphanage? They know it's time to draw a new clothing issue. And what do you know? It fits. To the 
the children of Korea, as well as to its aged and those stricken with poverty or disease, the hand clasp from America brings more than the food or the medicine or the clothing. It's a handful of hope. The guided missile cruiser Canberra demonstrates another aspect of the people to people program. Tied up in Karachi, she holds open house. During her round-the-world cruise, she welcomed more than 60,000 visitors, all of whom ask, how does it work? Well, you see, this gadget fits into this gizmo, and, oh, let's have a party. Presents and ice cream are more fun than missiles any day. Canberra, emissary of goodwill from our country to the world. People getting to know people. moment of truth for an idea, as the George Washington prepares for the first firing of a ballistic missile from an underwater submarine. It's a daring concept. This is its big test. The missile is tried and ready. The ship is tried and ready. But each has been tested independently. Now the control systems are energized, and the two become units of a single concept, the fleet ballistic missile submarine. The mounting tension is reflected on the faces of Captain Osborne and Admiral Rayburn. Minus 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Don't go, Admiral. Now, this is nickname, uh, stand by for a 10 second count. Stand by, stand Nine by, feet. stand by, 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 far, so good, but Polaris is a two-stage missile. Separation of the stages is a critical item. To reach the target nearly 1,200 miles distant, everything must work perfectly. To have come this far and then fail would be almost unendurable. Good separation. Good separation, Pat. We just got second stage ignition. The instrumentation indicates. Already in the works, a longer range for Polaris. But this was the shot that said, Polaris works. 